We've got Phil Hesketh here, who's the founder of Consent Kit. Uh, as a service designer and user researcher, Phil founded Ethics Kit in 2017, uh, developing tools to enable ethical considerations within design workflows. After completing an MA at the wonderful Hyper Island, we've got, got our own graduate here. <laughs> uh, Phil went on to work with clients such as Co op, uh, Common Good. Uh, UNHCR and Hiring Hub, and with his working forward, his research into informed consent, developing de developing it into tangible products, was the logical next step. Phil Hasker. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, so, I guess I kind of want to start with a big philosophical question, because it's kind of like to do this. So, uh, around 2017, I started thinking about this a lot more, and like it was a time when I was doing the thesis for my master's, and I started thinking about design and how we were interacting with other people. Uh, and I started wondering, like, are we treating people to means to our ends, or are we treating them as ends in their own in their own right? Uh, and the vibe at the time, it felt like we were trying to do really good stuff, and this this thing kept coming up and kept bothering me. So um, that was kind of when I was doing my masters at Hyper Island, and then as part of that, we wrote a, a thesis, so it gave me like three months to really dig into this and sort of find out some bigger things. And then off the back of that, ethics kit was born, and I started to look at ways that we could do uh, different considerations and kind of like get into some of this stuff, but nothing really was happening and the uptake wasn't really great on it. Um, GDPR kind of came along in like 2018, which most people are smiling and also a few you've got some experience with. Uh, so everyone was panicking at this point. It was like, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to get fined and, you know, our data is not in the right place. And then uh, a little bit, or actually a little bit before that, the um, my timeline's wrong, I've just realised. <laughs> um, the Cambridge Analytica thing happened uh, with Facebook and then everybody was just kind of like, you know, we, you started to see this so at this point. My phone started ringing a little bit more, and it was like, wow, like, you know, the ethics are really important, and data is really important. So, that, that was, it was kind of like nice, but under the worst possible circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, and then sort of at like the beginning of this year, uh, I founded Consent Kit, um, because basically three things started to happen. So trust, trust in organisations has been collapsing for kind of a long time, and um, in, in trust in tech giants in particular is, is you know, just even more. This was a YouGov poll, and it's like 93% of people don't trust uh, Instagram with their data. Um, pretty good reasons, but you're thinking like, wow, like we're so active on these things. Like, what's kind of going on? You know, and like, how do people, how do people kind of feel about this? So uh, the other thing was organisations were coming under more and more pressure around like, how do they handle this data and like uh, things like GDPR and in California in January uh, next year, the the CCPA is going to come out, which is like their equivalent um, of it. It's quite similar. And then Canada are way ahead of the game. They've had the thing called Pipe Death since 2004. So like globally, all these things started to kind of like change. Uh, and policies coming in, so organisations are kind of freaking out about like how do we how do we manage the risk around this, and then finally like the role of uh, a lot of with ethics care, I spent a lot of time researching uh, design and like how design was done and like where it was going and, and all this sort of stuff, and I feel like the the role of design in businesses is actually really changing. Um, most of the projects I've worked on over the last couple of years have all been transformation projects basically, so it's kind of organisations are thinking like how do we take advantage of this stuff, things like the design index, uh, which was uh, a, a tracker survey done against companies who were, I think it was 50 companies who had design as a strategy and, and designers in their boardroom uh, and they tracked them over 10 years against the Standard & Poor and then the, the design led companies outperformed by like, like 213% or something like this. So like, there's a clear like advantage of it, you know, of, of using design in this way. So business started to really get, get hold of this. But it's kind of meant as well that the way that we're working as designers and the sort of a lot of the work that we're doing is becoming less transactional and more relational. So like if we do research with someone like that relationship might actually occur over a longer period of time. So. Those, I sort of noticed those three uh, trends, uh, and so like why why informed consent? So I kind of feel like these relationships are really important, and like going back to whether we treat people as means in their own right. Um, but it felt like a, a lot of the consent that I was doing and the things that I was seeing around me were were just it was a piece of paper and it was something we would print and get signed off, and then it would go in my bag, and then I might take it out at some point and scan it, or it might not. It might you know, get lost in a locker somewhere, or and this kind of thing just felt like an absolute sort of mess. If someone ever actually rang me up and said. I wanted to withdraw it, you know, you're kind of in a bit of a cold sweat because it's like, how do I actually, like, how do I actually track this back and then how do I find the data that was, like, linked next to that person? So I kind of realised just through ethics care, I was like, I really need to put my game research-wise in, in doing this. So I started to log stuff out manually and this was taking ages. It was taking me probably for five to ten people I was researching with. I was probably spending about uh, three hours on average just doing the admin and doing the logging to make sure that it would meet the standards that the Information Commissioner's Office have met in order to sort of meet GDPR. So I felt that was a big missed opportunity around this. And then the other thing was, I, as part of Consent Kit, we had these modular cards and uh, I, thought, I thought it was like a really nice system for, in order to understand like how much to share and like what to actually write in these consent documents. 
we're kind of scaling this across the whole organization or the whole research community was really difficult because everybody had their own way of doing it and then, and then you know there was also no oversight really so like what was all the consent that we've obtained and like how is this information uh, how's the research data being used the people deleting it on time are they remembering to do that so there's kind of none of that and also there was no opportunities to give participants more autonomy and more transparency around what you were doing and what you were doing with their information and whether you would actually you know be able to hold you to account um so we, started asking, we basically started out by just asking ourselves three big questions and they were like, how might we create further opportunities to build trust uh, with, with participants and kind of restore this in, in organisations by handling their data more ethically and more responsibly? Excuse me, like how might we make it easy for people under pressure, like design, in design teams, to manage that information? Like, you know, if you can give someone three, three or four hours back on one round of research, like that's kind of huge, they can spend that time synthesising, which means they get better outcomes, which means you, know, you do better work. Um, and then finally, like, how do we just keep this standard really high? Like, research is a team sport. I wanted to invite all of my developers that I was working with, all of the other designers that I was working with, to come out and see firsthand, you know, what, what was going on, and I wanted to get them involved in research as well. So, how could I do that in a way where the, the standard of how we obtain consent and how we manage that data was still like really, really high? Um, so, we built Consent Kit, and it's basically for people who do research, and also for people who manage people doing research. <laughs> And that, that's kind of it. But we've, we've kind of—it was really weird in the first like, in the first like few months. My plan was to kind of just do this for design agencies at first, and then try and like get it into bigger organisations. But I thought that would be a little bit harder. But big organisations just came for us straight away, and were like, "We need this. We need this thing." And like you, you know, universities and like, academics have it. And I've even been talking to like vets as well. Like vets need consent apparently if they're going to do surgery on an animal. So I was like, "Okay, I didn't see that in this case coming." But, um, so you, there's kind of actually like it's one of the main legal basis for processing data, and there's nothing really to manage it or to kind of uh, to, to sort of have that you know, to manage that relationship. Sorry. So um, yeah, well, we, what we wanted to do really was try and build trust through through transparency and just make it really easy to do that, um, especially when you're managing communities of research or even just like on a one-to-one -one level. Uh, and then really, like, our strategy is to try and figure out what best practice looks like and then just make it so easy to do that that it's actually better. It's easier and faster to do that than it is to do, do it any other way. Um, and we're going to do that really by giving time back to researchers to do research. Uh, and then finally, to make it really easy for organisations to manage their information uh, and get that oversight of it. So that kind of reduces the risk uh, for them. So... But then, you know, so kind of people say to me, like, why did you use tech to do this? Like, if people don't trust technology, like, what, what, what's going on? So I kind of think that um, a, lot of the, a lot of the problems that we have are actually, like, really simple, like, really daft pro problems. And the problem really is you just don't have time to do stuff. So things like remembering to delete uh, recordings after the, your period agreed in your consent document. Like, this is something you could put a calendar invite in and do that if you were, like, ultra-organised, right? But, you know, there's like, uh, or, you know, be just having, knowing what, what the right document to use was and knowing that it was, like, written to a standard that was kind of compliant and it was, like, good. Again, like, this is, like, really, so there was, like, a collection of really simple problems and it's like, we can solve all of these, even automatically generating the administration for you just through the activities and how you use the platform, but doing it to the standard that the ICO, like, wants to see. So, it was like, there's kind of, like, loads of simple things in this. Um, so, it, it just kind of seemed like an obvious one. And... The other thing is, obviously, which I'm assuming you all believe because the event's called Tech for Good. Is, <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I really think tech, tech should be a good thing, you know. And the things that the things that make tech not good isn't isn't always really tech. It's it's like business models around technology, you know, uh, that are sort of putting profit like before purpose. It's not that profit's bad, you know. It's, it's just like profits profits fine and makes things sustainable. But it's like how do you do it in a way that you know that we we can sort of like you know balance this and get this trust back. Um, you know, how do we not exploit people or do, you know, do other things? Um, so, and I was kind of like really, I, my, you know, my head's like very much in this ethical design space. And it was really felt like uh, I wanted to partner up with someone and just say, like, ethics gets super theoretical. It's basically just like a research project now. And what I didn't have was any, any like, case studies. It's like, well, what's this like when you put it into contact with the real world, you know? So um, I, pa I paired up with someone that I used to work with at the co-op, who's a really good developer, but also, like, really good business-minded. And he's very much of like the lean startup like kind of world. And I was like, so it's really interesting, like what happens when we sort of put heads and come together and do this? And like, how do we figure this out? And how do we like eat our own dog food, if you like? Uh, to, you know, to say like, you know, can we actually do this? What, what are the challenges? Like what's, what doesn't work? What, what doesn't make sense? So I really wanted to go along that journey to find out what that was. And then probably write a book or something. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so 
we've got uh, we've got a product now, and it's uh, people are using it. Um, it's kind of really good. So we're starting to see like data back, and we're starting to understand like how this thing is is actually making an impact, um, which is great. So people have got a better idea of what they're getting into, and then they can make better decisions. Uh, we can send them consent way ahead of time rather than turning up on the day with a document, and it's almost like it removes kind of coercion, so they have time to think about stuff. Um, Less admin equals more synthesis. More synthesis equals better outcomes is kind of a thing. We're saving like a, a ton of time for people. Um, one of the things we did early on was we have this thing called early access at the moment, which we invited people to. And we're kind of growing this community quite slowly, but quite and quite carefully, and we're letting people use it for real. And one of the things we, we started to do in the early days was take it away from people at the end to see where this idea of you could come in for like use it for three months and then see how you get on with it. And when we tried to take it away from people, they got really upset. <laughs> that, was like, that was like a good sign that it's like it's kind of actually saving people time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, finally, it was like making it easier to manage this data well. So, sort of now for the first time, um, from like a research ops perspective, like we've got this oversight of all of the research that's happening, all of the uh, consent that's being obtained, who's like storing recordings against it, where those recordings are. So, if somebody calls up and says, uh, you know, do you have any information on me? We can just do a quick search. We can find that and you can tell them straight away if you want to be. We can compile that into a report and say this is everything that we have and then we can delete that, which is what happens after someone asks to see all the information. Uh, and then you, we can do that afterwards. But also the data hygiene is, is really improved, like all of the data is getting uh, deleted on time because we're just sending out emails saying you agree to 90 days in the document, it's been 90 days, like you know, you need to delete these, delete these files. Um, so yeah, the vision kind of like longer term out. It feels like this most days, like for us, the minutes is just two of us. Um, but the, the vision is really like, is like if, you know, if, if research becomes like, how, how do we build these relationships and how do we like uh, get trust back into what we're doing? And I think as well, one thing that some people have called me out on and it's a really good call is, is that they say, well, yeah, but consent isn't the only like thing that you used to build trust with. And it, it, can, it is absolutely right and it isn't. And really that's down to if, if what well, I believe is that's down to the researcher and the researcher like, does that and it breaks the ice and warms, warms you know, things up with them and, and gets them to open up. But, but the consent is, is really the legal basis you know, for, that, for that relationship and that thing. And that's the thing that the person has to hold, hold them to account. And making the processes afterwards if they want to see what's going on or they want to withdraw from that like, really, really painless and easy is, is kind of like the thing that, you know, that I think we can make, we can make better. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved, uh, we're, we're still in early access now. We probably will be till around the end of the year. Um, but it's uh, we're, there's a bit of a waiting list. But if you put like tech for good in the thing when you fill the form out, I'll, I'll see if I can bump you up a bit. Um, <laughs> and then like we'll see. Uh, we're just what we're, what we're doing at the moment is letting people use it for free. Like one of the main drivers for our products is like uh, you own all of your data. Like you can do what you want with it. If you want to download that in a machine readable format, you can. If you want to delete it at any time, you can. Uh, the, we've built this using with the um, Open Data Institute using a lot of their, uh, their data ethics canvas and stuff like that, which is what we got from the content, uh, from ethics kit, sorry. And um, so all these questions around like how long we keep email logs for and stuff like that is really important for us. Like and the thing we want to work on next is kind of making that data mobility better. Um, and we were talking to them today about defining the standard, but we said that's like a 10 year journey. I was like, okay, maybe there's an interim <laughs> step that we can do. Um, but yeah, we're just this kind of thing of like, you, you own your data, even on the trial as well, when it's free to use, you own the data, and we're not gonna, if, you want, if you're not happy and you wanna take it, you can, you can that's absolutely fine. Uh, and it's kind of unlimited uh, unlimited usage as well. But if it gets to more than about 20 users, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's it. Fantastic. Have we got some? <laughs> It looks like a brilliant product. Are you going to give us a product demo? Uh, a new thing. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, we kind of like arrange everything by, uh, by projects. Uh, and then we have uh, with these things called events. This is like the hardest thing to name in the world. We called them like rounds of research and like sessions and all these other things. And we just settled on event in the end. But an event is basically like if you, if you want to go out and do some interviews, we just call that like an event. And you could have five people or ten people or whatever. Um, so this is kind of a... Uh, a demo project um, that we've got, so none of this sort of information is like uh, is actually real. Um, so I, I've got a slightly big one actually. This is kind of the most awkward product demo in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. there you go. So you can have like a bunch of people uh, in there, and then what this essentially gives you is like it, we we automatically like label people. And we just did this at first, and then everyone got really like angry because they're like, I can't remember who like the different people are. 
Um, and then when you click into the next page, you can kind of see the name anyway, so we like might as well bring it out to make it a bit more practical. But we typically try to refer to people by these, by these different names, and then it just automatically, um, automatically generates them. So you can see here that like Bob's agreed to, uh, to the consent for the sketching workshop on this. Uh, he was asked on this day, and then he, that's when he's agreed, and we've not put any like, links up to them. But we've got some links for Steve, so let's take a look at him. So as you're kind of going through, it starts to build this like activity log out for each, each person that we have. So you can see that when they were created, they were, excuse me, they were sent an email to take part in the research, and this was when they agreed. Um, and then we've added uh, interviews uh, recordings here. And then the change their participant details like at this point, so that's kind of added in. So anything that you do to the person, it like builds up that log over a period of time. Uh, and then you can take this page down and kind of like convert that as a report and then send off to people. Um, does, the, does the person give consent via the system as well? Is there a yeah. yeah. So uh, if does anyone want to do a should we, should we like just do super risky like actually send it to someone and get permission? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling dangerous. Um, <laughs> if we go back to uh, so th these forms are actually like locked at this point. So what it typically does when you create an event, it gives you a form um, to sign in. So we have like a, a templating system built in. So we recommend we have like a bunch of templates that we suggest in case you don't have your own, but you can like overwrite those and like put your own templates in, which is what most people do. Um, at the moment, this is like super basic. It's just like a, a text editor with like checkboxes and some other bits built in. But um, just before Christmas. It's going to be our last like, release of the year. We've made this like really modular, so you can actually define the form however you want it. You can put like so whatever format your, your consent is in, you can you can kind of build that build that out. But what this, when you actually go through and edit a form, um, it, it prompts you to kind of if, uh, if it fills this stuff in automatically for you because it's like one to reduce the amount of time it takes people to do that. But then there's something around like which is like enter what here. Uh, this is usually like red in the actual when you're editing it in the form, so it just kind of asks you to do that and it gives you some context, it's quite quick. And we got it down from like 17 things that you needed to input um, to like three things now. So it's like you can just go in, just change those things, everything else has automatically been pulled in. Like what to expect, because we know what type of event it is, we've just got, we can like recommend content for that. Um, and if you, with this new template system, the organisation will actually be able to create their own custom event types and actually like define those as well. Um, so that's kind of like how that works. And then you've got like, yeah, this is like a data retention policy that's kind of global. So you set that uh, at an organization level and just pulls that down for you. So you don't have to think about that. Uh, and then these are kind of like the granular options. If you take a look at what this actually looks like, does that say preview? Yeah, preview. Yeah. Is so, it open source, this? Uh, no, I've been no. talking to people about that as well <laughs> <laughs> recently. So one of the things I want to do is, um, to be completely honest, I don't really understand op the open source. Like, I'm trying to figure out how that can work as a business model. So it's, it was kind of faster for us at first just to kind of make it proprietary and keep going on. What I really want to do is not create a proprietary system. And so we're going to open things up to API serving so talk to different systems. But also, um, I really, I'd really like to like create uh, some more <coughs> mobility around the data. So if somebody else wanted to use it in their system or whatever, what we're going to do, I think, is publish our schema for how consent formed and then if they built a system and it what you could read into that scheme you could do it. This is when I was talking to the guy about defining a standard but he's like that's like a ten year journey just like back, back away, you know. <laughs> so I was like we, we might do it at some point but it's you know, for where we are right now. So yeah what what this when you create the editor thing what it does is it turns it into like a signable form. So this is uh, this is like the remote form version. So this these turn into kind of checkboxes and uh, at the, the bottom is just kind of like a positive opt-in. So because we're sending it to an email, it's like a unique thing and we've generated a unique link and a timestamp with that to say, we sent this email at this time, this person opened this link and they did a positive opt-in. So we can kind of guarantee that it's that person that's gone to and that makes it legally admissible. When you do it in person, it's a little different because uh, anyone could sign it and say it was that person. So we have to have, uh, at the moment, we've just got like a signature on there, a bit like DocuSign. And it kind of works great if you have a touch screen, like an iPad or something like that. It's terrible on a trackpad, like it really doesn't work. <laughs> Um, so we we're gonna we want to add like a, maybe like a video so like a bit like Monzo you know and you just click a button and say this is me. Um, so that's there's still like I say we've still got a lot to do and there's a lot to, to build on again. Um, but if you can also print these as well like sometimes papers like your best bet you know so uh, it converts it into a printable form for you and then you just tick the boxes and you can go. Where, uh, so, uh, where where do you store the data? Is so, it on Amazon or? Yeah, so it's on like Heroku, but it's on AWS ultimately. So everything's uh, stored on there. We've got a, um, a security page which which details like 
absolutely everything about how we structure in terms of like who we use, all the third parties that we use, and like the different levels of like encryption and all that stuff. And where the data centres are, whether in the UK or uh, Europe? In, the, Europe or in, the, in Europe, <coughs> yeah. Um, so there's some, I think if we, we spoke to a few people in government, and I think it might be important for them to be in the UK, but they were potentially more like, well, what actually you want? So they might want to use their own data centres. So there's, there's, when, we, when we speak to different people, we kind of get into like different sets of use cases. We're trying to like figure figure some of that stuff out. Um, most mostly people are okay with it in the in the EU, um, but yeah, it's uh, I don't know what's going to happen after Brexit. Like you know, whether it's going to be like we need to go UK, but I mean I'm, just, I'm hoping one of the providers will fix that problem and then we just go okay and then we can kind of put it onto that because um, that could be a, a bit of a minefield. Um, so yeah, that, I mean uh, what else I've not shown you. Um, that's basically like. It, Basically, basically, you kind of come in. In fact, let's go through and create a new, a new event, create a new document. So we kind of had this idea originally of like different types. So this is like I've defined an organisation level document here, and then these are the standard consent to, uh, consent kit documents. Um, we kind of scrapped that idea because it doesn't really make sense if someone's taken the time to define an org document. It's like why would you use one of ours? Like they're going to want to use theirs, right? So uh, with the whole like onboarding process from just creating a new event has has been really streamlined. So Ben's gone to his brother's wedding and he's not pushed the code before he went, so I was like, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, so this is kind of like what the editor looks like, so you can kind of see the text is, is sort of red uh, in there, and then you just kind of go through and, and change it. And a lot of stuff might, might not be relevant, so you can just kind of delete it. It's faster to delete it than it is to add it, I guess. Um, yeah, it kind of just pulls policies in. It's like put my email address in and make that kind of clickable as well. Uh, yeah, and then... The final thing is kind of linking recordings. So at the moment, it's just like really basic, uh, in that you literally, if you use like uh, Google Drive or something like this, or OneDrive or Box or whatever, like you can create a URL from from the file and then just kind of paste that, uh, paste that into here, and then we've just got the connection to it, and then we send you the uh, send you the link across. So if we say, uh, so this is another thing we kind of want to integrate it a bit closer with. Um, with like uh, just like integrations and things like that. So if you had the recording on your phone, like you could just say share it with like consent kit, and then it would automatically like put it next to the right uh, the right person for you. So that thing, just this stuff like that, really. It's just more like UXy stuff. Um, so it's done on then. Let's call it. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, you can see now they've got that on. And then if you click on Bob, as you can see, we've just added it in now. And that's kind of what is there. Uh, if you want to see as well what they've got permission for, so we want to kind of pull this through into the activity feed. But one of the interesting things as well is like as you're kind of moving around with different parts of the system, it's like how how is like PII link, leaking across like different bits and into different databases and stuff, and like how do you minimise how many databases like that information is is kind of stored in? What we want to do is pull this into the activity feed. Um, it's just that we have, to, we have to have a separate record as well because like this is like the definitive one. So they could come in and change their mind three or four times, and that might change in the feed, which could be a bit confusing. So. We kind of have a separate a separate record for it as well. But so the, the recordings on Google Drive or OneDrive or what have you, um, do you create a copy of them? No. Do you, do you clone their, those files? No. Um, in which case, when someone has to delete them, do you actively go into Google Drive and OneDrive and remove them? We don't at the moment because we're not sort of deeply integrated. Uh, the solution we sort of seem to be arriving at is we're going to integrate with uh, Google Drive the organisation is going to let us define that structure, and mm -hmm. um, because there's other, and then if, if it comes in, we could potentially like delete that. But we really want to give them control over that because some people are like fine with that, and some people are really uncomfortable with yeah, that. Yeah. So you basically just say these are the files you need to delete. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's how it works right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the other use case around that, which I thought was really interesting, is that like if you work in an organisation, you have a lot of contractors or people are moving between teams a lot. You might want to shift ownership of everything from one person to another person, and if we've got links to all the recordings, we could say transfer all the ownership from, from me to, to the person that's coming in after me. So it kind of makes those handovers like really, really slick. And then if someone comes in and does an information request that doesn't go to me, it goes to them and we update everything uh, for it. So it's just like it's like those just like admin housekeeping jobs that are kind of a pain to do, but it's like we can just kind of automate that really with tech, which is really nice. Going to stop it. Yes. Yeah. Some pizza at last. <laughs> Everybody, uh, give uh, Phil. <laughs>